Hello everyone and welcome to another I Work in Sports live interview. Uh, it's great to, to have you uh, here with us. As, as you may know, or if you don't know, my name is Jean Fugerio. I'm the founder of uh, I Work in Sports. And as always, it is a pleasure uh, to have you here with us. Thank you uh, for being there. Uh, I see that some people are already uh, logging in, sending some messages. It would be great if you let us know where you're watching from and, you know, prepare to participate in that conversation um, with my guest that I'll introduce you in one second. Uh, as, as you know, it would be super appreciated if you hit that like button as well. And if you're interested in this type of um, uh, content that we have here, talking about career in sport, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit that uh, bell uh, sign as well. As you saw in the this ad at the introduction, uh, we are organizing the Education Virtual Expo that actually takes uh, place in five days only. This is a, a digital event. It's targeted to anyone that uh, either wants to work in sport or if you're already working in sport, but uh, you might want to boost your career through education and you're looking at or considering doing some uh, masters in sport, that is a great place for you to go and meet some of the best uh, courses in the world there. So we'll be have many programs that take place here in Europe, uh, a program from India, a couple from, from the US. Uh, it's free to attend. If you wanna, if you haven't registered yet, there's a link in the description below. Um, just so you know, on Monday, I will uh, be giving a demo and uh, we'll have a Q&A session. So we'll show you the platform, everything, you know, how it works. If you have questions, you're not sure, you can join us uh, at 4 p.m. at uh, European time. So also there's a link in the description below. And um, yes, now let me quickly introduce my guest. It's a friend. Uh, Pierre Ducré, he's uh, the International Olympic Committee's Olympic Games Operations Director. He'll explain to us exactly what uh, he does there. Uh, Pierre has an outstanding career in sport. We've known each other for many years. He's uh, my senior at the, the FIFA Master. He graduated in 2003. It was uh, the third edition and I did uh, the fifth one. So since then, We've been in touch. I've been following his steps and his uh, success. Uh, short, shortly after graduating, he actually worked for a short period of time at the at the office of the special advisor of the United Nations um, Secretary General on promoting peace and development through sports. And then he moved to the IOC at the time as an intern. If I'm not wrong actually recruited by another friend of ours. I think it might have been John Siner who, who brought him in. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, in 2007, he might correct me if I'm wrong with the dates later, he was appointed head of uh, sports operations and international federation of relations at the IOC in 2010. Kept climbing, went, uh, became head of Olympic Games uh, coordinator and in 2014, Olympic Games Associate Director. Until uh, early this year, I think it was in March, he was appointed the Olympic Games Operations Director. Well, that's a brilliant career right there. So we're gonna get uh, dive into more details. Let's uh, have uh, Pierre joining us right after this.
Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for uh, the kind introduction. Yeah, you have to let me know if I got everything right. A any remarks? Uh, was there anything wrong there? In the yeah, I think there's a mistake regarding who hired me. It was definitely not John, but he was ah. there at the IOC when I uh, started. Indeed, he was one of the first few uh, CIS uh, alumni that joined the IOC, but uh, it wasn't him directly who hired me. Okay, so correction made. I'm sure that uh, I'm going to <laughs> make some other mistakes uh, during the, the live. Before we, we start, Pierre, uh, let me just give you a sense of uh, people who's watching. Everybody sort of saying hello. Actually, if you can actually tell us where you're watching from, that will help us. Uh, Pelika7 is some, someone that you know. Uh, Renata as well. There's a contingent here from, from, from the fifth master. She, she's in Lausanne. Yuri Dominguez from Brazil. He was here last week as well. Uh, Jakub uh, in India. There's Sean uh, in, in France. Um, well, uh, Devin in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Regina in Brazil, Otacilio also in Brazil, a lot of people from Brazil there. There's Camila Murray in Canada. And who else? Oh, oh Enrique Pelosi, grande, working at Juventus in, in Torino, also a friend of ours. And um, Sonia from Colombia, helping us as well with the project with the uh, a Work and Sport Education Virtual Expo. Now, Pierre, uh, I sent an email to, to some people to tell them about the, the interview and we posted that on social media as well. And I want to right from the beginning, make it clear that uh, we're not here to talk about the Olympic games uh, in Tokyo or any other political things related to the IOC. But in order to prevent any questions, uh, can we maybe start, if you have any updates, that's anything that you can give us in terms of updates about the the Tokyo Games, so we can take that out of the way and move more to the discussion about career. Yeah, I guess uh, everyone always wants to hear about this topic. This is basically what I talk about all day already. So I definitely don't want to make this uh, this time with uh, this great group of people from everywhere, it seems, the focus of today. But uh, as you can imagine, we are working very hard right now on Tokyo. Uh, we are uh, in a place where we feel that uh, things are lining up to have a great event next summer. Uh, we have confirmation from the highest level of uh, the government in Japan that uh, this is a shared objective. So I don't want to go into any kind of details, but we are doing everything with the organizers, with the Japanese government, with the entire Olympic movement uh, to, uh, to be in a place next summer to have uh, great Olympic Games, and we are very excited about uh, being in a position to do that. Great, uh, great, yeah, thank you for that. And yes, so to everybody watching, um, we're going to focus the discussion here really on, on career. I'm sure that uh, Pierre, with the career that he has, he will have lots of uh, great advice. Pierre, before we, we talk then about your career, maybe start explaining to us then what is your job today? Uh, yeah, what, what, what you do, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you don't have a, a normal day at work so, uh, uh, every day, but if you were to sort of explain your role, maybe the, the number of people that are sort of working under you, maybe right uh, directly under you or other, what are the departments that um, you oversee, give us a sense of uh, your job at the IOC. So I think my job title is actually quite self-explanatory, uh, you know, operations director. So as such, for the Olympic Games, I make sure that uh, the IOC is um, basically tracking progress, advising the organizing committee, working with the stakeholders in a really uh, aligned manner. We have in the IOC, as some of you may know, um, Department of the Olympic Games, which is basically coordinating all of the IOC efforts when it comes to uh, to the game. So we're working with the marketing department, the sport department, the finance department, and under me and my team, I have, I guess now some 25 people, but we really work inside the organization with 
uh, I would say, 100 people more or less who are working day in, day out on the Olympic Games. The IOC has close to 600 people, I think, today. But I would say that are really looking at the Games on a daily basis. It's probably somewhere between 100 and 150. And then a lot of people which can come and go. But I would say in the central team, what we call the Games Management Team that we are leading, uh, there's probably 100 and 150. 50 uh, people at this point in time and what we do really is making sure we are working in a co-construction uh, manner with the uh, organizing committees uh, working with them to identify the issues propose solutions and making sure we can together find the best option to address whatever challenge comes our way and that's i would say you asked what is really what i do all day I would say mostly, if I have to summarize, I sit in meetings trying to uh, solve problems. And uh, that's more or less what is the essence of my day. And in that respect, to your point earlier, it definitely provides for a different day every day. Because uh, <laughs> any day brings its, uh, I would say, set of challenges. And uh, these days, they are mostly medical. So uh, I would say uh, it is a lot about uh, countermeasures for the games. What kind of uh, plans can we make to address any kind of situation? So it's a lot about uh, that these days. But in general, it's really about um, having people from our respective teams coming up uh, to, uh, to me or, or to my boss, Christophe Duby, to try and find uh, solutions to uh, issues we are facing. Great. Thank you for that. And yeah. Then how, how did you start? Um, with, with, we said that you, you did the FIFA Master back then, but uh, I don't know if you had some sport experience before. And what actually drove you to, to, to start a career in sport? And tell us how you did it. Yeah, so I think you mentioned I went through the FIFA Master. I was one of the very early edition when it was still more or less, uh, you know, I would say a toss up to uh, try and uh, take the Master because you didn't have it uh, uh, very clearly lined up where were the um, graduates going. So it was really a, a time where uh, I think doing the master was an opportunity to develop the knowledge and somehow to establish a network in sport, which I clearly didn't have at the time. So I, um, I was working uh, in media, more or less, but in parallel to a, a first master degree I did in international relations. So whilst I was doing this, uh, this master, I had an undergrad in uh, journalism. So I was working in media and doing both, uh, more or less, at the same time. So yes, we do share that. In, uh, I never knew that. So me too. I'm a, journal I'm a journalist as well. To try and find out secrets about one another. So. <laughs> Really, I, I was uh, when I completed my master in international relation in Geneva. Uh, I was wondering what is it I'm going to do right now, and I was trying to look at what are the things that really I enjoy doing. And I think it was very clear to me it was working in an international environment. It was um, big projects, big events. I always was attracted by that, and. My, let's say, media career had really been focused on sport because mostly I had weekends free and that's where most of the sport was happening. So I had become kind of a, a commentator for events and uh, reporting on some events as well. So all of this was coming together to more or less shape up my interest. And uh, I thought the master at that time was really the best way to combine it because it was leading to a career in international sport. So that was really appealing to me. You mentioned it. I came out of the master and the opportunity to go to the UN, which because of my international relations background made a lot of sense uh, for me at the time. Uh, I was working on promotion of uh, development and peace through sport. Very interesting as a, I would say, platform. I was working for the special advisor to the UN Secretary General in this respect. But sometimes when you're an intern, you know, your role can be more limited. And this was the case for me in that uh, position. I had kind of a, wasn't really an internship, was more of a temporary contract. But what I was asked to do was not particularly exciting. So although I thought it could be definitely a place 
that could combine all of my interests. Um, I seeked other opportunities and ended up uh, having an internship at the IOC. And uh, as surprising as that can be, first to me, I'm still there today. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, personal curiosity, since you had a degree in uh, journalism and communications, when you decided that you wanted to work, be more involved with um, with sports and you, you you didn't think of doing through that route, maybe sort of communications. Um, you you wanted to do something different from communications. Was that clear to you? Uh, I actually never considered to work in communication somehow. So maybe had the opportunity come up uh, in the early days in the IOC, I could have because I somehow had that uh, kind of background. But I think I was always more attracted by uh, the sport and event side of, uh, of things. So uh, I wasn't per se a communicator or somebody that was passionate about communication. I was more intrigued when it comes to journalism about, uh, you know, like uh, the, the research part, I would say the, uh, the uh, going deep into subject matters and trying to, uh, you know, bring up the stories rather than what I was doing really in journalism, which was more, I would say, the day-to-day -day activities. I was working for a local newspaper and a local radio. And you start feeling after a couple of years that you are on repeat mode a little bit. I felt yeah. I was doing the same things, interviewing the same people over and over again. And uh, it wasn't very fulfilling to me. So somehow I, I was really trying to see how I could project myself into, um, I would say, an environment where the challenges were different and uh, also uh, not the same. I tend to get very quickly bored. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I really enjoy the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges are very different on a daily basis. No, oh, I, I feel you. I actually, when, when I came to, to Europe, I knew that I didn't want to work as a journalist anymore in, in my head. And it was funny because right after the Masters, I was offered um, a job uh, with, with FIFA at their online to do basically journalism work for the World Cup in Germany. And I gave preference to um, a very small startup. And then they told me that they couldn't they couldn't pay me. So suggested I went to FIFA and then I went uh, back to, to SportCal that, that you know. But um, Pierre, um, I wanted to know, I don't know if you ever had uh, that uh, exercise maybe of self-reflection, but uh, if you were to analyze yourself and think of your strengths, your attributes, your skills, what do you think are the main skills or attributes that uh, brought you to the successful career that uh, you had? No, I don't actually look back and think why I ended up here. Um, now that you asked the question, I think it definitely takes a lot of commitment. I mean, I did invest a lot of my energy into uh, my career. So I think you need to demonstrate that you are committed and that you are bringing value. That's the first thing. And I, no matter how smart one can be, I think, uh, you know, the commitment to uh, the task and uh, the ability to deliver according to standards, timeline and to stand out somehow is definitely something that will uh, allow you to progress or, um, or not somehow. So I'd say definitely uh, committed to uh, do what I do well. I would say that's certainly something I have uh, that if I go after a task, I will try to uh, uh, get this task across the finish line in the best possible way in the shortest amount of time. And that's, uh, that's something that uh, I had always, uh, including through the master that I did, I always wanted to somehow do what I do well. So I'd say this, I, I love to find solutions. That's something also I have in my um, daily life. You know, I, I, I like to think about how to resolve problems in general. So uh, that's something which is put to good use in the IOC because I think it's, uh, it's a good skill to have that you can see a pathway, uh, to use a word I've uh, heard on CNN at least 200,000 times over the last two days, but yeah. uh, uh, a pathway to between point A and point B, which is manageable for everyone. You know, being able to navigate in complicated issues 
to show that there can be a way to resolve it. I think this is something which um, I, I enjoy doing and uh, I think I, I managed to do pretty well and uh, that can be very useful. So I would say if you have that kind of ability to resolve problem and that you are not afraid to put in the work and, um, and be committed to what you do, uh, you can, I think, go quite far, no matter what technical background you, you can have, because the reality is coming in the IOC. I had a master, I'd worked in media, but I didn't really have a whole lot of uh, practical experience in, um, in sport or events. But uh, if you, uh, you know, you, you build that experience as you, as you move forward. I actually worked at the very beginning in the IOC on the athlete career program, which was the uh, program we launched at the time. I was hired to do that after my internship to uh, facilitate the transition of athletes towards professional career. And I remember running a, a survey with ADECO that demonstrated that technical skills at the time were only coming as the seventh thing recruiters were looking for. So there were six other elements that they were looking in possible recruits before they were wondering if you were a true specialist of this or that area. And that's something that always stayed with me. Of course, if you need to build uh, you know, a motor, okay, you have to be a mechanic. But for the kind of jobs we do, even today, I still really look into the potential of the person, the profile of the person is potential development uh, abilities rather than, you know, does he have two or 16 years of experience? I think uh, is, is important, but to a lesser degree uh, than the ability of the person to, you know, commit to a task, to work in a team, to take feedback constructively and to progress whilst uh, in the job. That's uh, great information. Do you do you remember what were the the, the top ones S since um, the technical skills were maybe number six or seven? Do you remember maybe some of the, the ones that were in the top? Well, definitely there was because it was focused a little bit on athletes. So a lot was about you know being uh, goal oriented uh, to be able to uh, implement a certain level of discipline, be a team player to demonstrate leadership, charisma, uh, to take feedback uh, well and to act upon it. So I would say definitely uh, those were a number of them. I couldn't tell you for sure what the six were, but those right. elements for sure came before be a you know, proven uh, professional in, uh, in that very field. So I suppose you, you hire loads of people in there to, to work uh, with you or you oversee uh, the hiring of uh, of many people at, at the IOC, then are those the things that you uh, look at uh, w when you're hiring, those uh, attributes that you just uh, mentioned? Most definitely. On my side, really, I, I really look at all of these elements. I try to understand the personality. I, um, I value those elements very much. I always think that uh, if you want to work with somehow with someone, it's important somehow you, you feel that uh, you would want to have a coffee with this person, that the personality also is someone you want to work with, especially if you are expected to spend a lot of time with those people. There needs to be as well an ability of uh, relaying with uh, the personalities rather than just uh, the profile. Then you yeah. also need to be uh, you know, staying away from recruiting always the same people with the same profile because Ultimately, you end up, you know, replicating the team with the uh, same people as you are. But in general, I really value a lot the energy, the, um, the yeah, just those personal values and ways of looking at work uh, very much. Cool. Uh, that's called uh, super cool information. Yeah, uh, just to give you another sense of people uh, connecting and, and, and leaving messages from all over the place, just so you know where people are watching us from, Karina from Kazakhstan, actually based in Wales, um, Mateo in Colombia, we have hello Enio from Peru, O4 in Nigeria, well, all over the place, Hassan, oh, Hassan Pillai is CIS, so he, 
he's um, he's nearby. Uh, there is Carlos from Mexico, uh, Yasser from Saudi Arabia, Fabio is in Leicester. Fabio is actually a current student of the FIFA Master, so I suppose they're on a break now. And uh, yes, uh, and, and a few others in Mazi in Paris, in Franklin, in Goa, India. So very, very international crowd. Thank you. Prepare your questions, you know, don't hesitate, send, send them through and I'll get to them um, in a moment. Pierre, talking about then formal education, we, we just talked about what you look at uh, in a candidate. And I think you're very clear about it. I think you touched a little on uh, the, the importance of uh, formal education. But when we're talking about masters in sports, can you give people a sense how important that is perhaps it plays a role but it's not a decisive factor uh, factor whenever you're assessing a, a candidate so how important do you think uh, courses such as the fifth master or the scs or the Orton cruyff or many others uh, can can be yeah i mean if i look back at my personal case the masters uh, made a lot of sense because it didn't have a network in sport and I think today, if you are um, joining a master, the benefit is really it gives you access to people that you would never be able to access on your own. Connections, uh, opportunities that uh, through the master you can have and should build on. I always tell people, you know, the master is great. Uh, it brings a lot of content. You can learn a lot of theoretical things, but the value of the master is really what you do whilst you're in it, that you invest yourself in, uh, you know, building that network, demonstrate your interest, uh, making sure that uh, the, 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 the value is really completely absorbed from that standpoint. I, I really went into the master thinking, yeah, with this, I, uh, you know, I'm going to meet a lot of people and I should try and get what I can from them, be it from knowledge or establish a network because I didn't have that. And I think first and foremost, clearly for me as well, uh, at least the, the network part, the link that now exists, for example, uh, with alumni, if you look at the FIFA master, it gives you also access to a very large alumni network. Didn't exist back in my days, but uh, that's additional value I find of doing this kind of, uh, of master. Now, if you're already in the sport industry, already have a background in sport and a network, maybe the value of doing a master, I would say, is not as important. So the timing of doing it is probably essential. It can make sense at certain point in your career and not anymore at the later stages, I would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we have some questions uh, coming in. Actually, there are two that are more or less of the, the same. One is Hassan. Uh, could you ask Pierre how to boost uh, profile for the IOC? So what's the selection criteria? And um, I'm gonna compliment Renata says, what are the IOC current staff needs? How we as applicants can boost our profile to get an interview? To know how much you can, uh, probably some of that should be answered by HR, but you have your own experience. Uh, what advice you can give um, Renata and Hassan and everybody else uh, watching? Yeah, no, I think it would definitely be a question for my HR colleagues, which are doing a great job uh, going through a lot of, you know, spontaneous applications we are getting or the number of applications we're getting for uh, every position that we open, which is a lot. I have, and you're uh, rightfully pointed it out, recruited a lot of people over over the years that have been at the IOC. And uh, uh, for me, uh, what stands out, it's, uh, it's complicated when you have to go through hundreds of CVs. It's difficult to stand out through the CV itself. There needs to be, for sure, I would say at the IOC, uh, a match between the profile and the uh, requirements. That can seem a very uh, silly thing to say, but very often people just will see that their profile meets every criteria and feel that they could be suitable for a job in communication, event, uh, 
you know, finance or, uh, or marketing. And we do get uh, people that apply for all jobs. And that somehow for us is not really something we, we value because we feel that there is a profile, there is something you want to do. And that uh, if that's what you feel is the right job for you, no matter if it's in the IOC or not, but that's the area where you want to work, that's something we would look at. You know, if you apply for a job to work in venues because that's where you want to work, that's a very different thing than if you apply for every kind of uh, job um, out there. So I would say the first thing is really trying to match the, the criteria with the profiles because that's the information we have. Uh, then at the IOC right now, there is uh, opportunities being given for the applicants to record videos and answer questions so that we can get already that kind of personal feel from a larger number of people because it does come down to, you know, that ability to relay with the people and to hear how they position themselves, how they present themselves. But I will already be past the stage where you've been able to, uh, you know, make uh, an impression through um, uh, through your written application. So there is no miracle solution. I'd like to tell people, yes, if you do this, you will get an interview, but it doesn't quite work like that, as you know. So I would say it's really about making sure you have the right profile, try to approach maybe people you have in your network that can somehow uh, support your application. As we know, this is, and it has always been a factor somehow. It's definitely not a decisive factor in the IOC, but it could be a positive factor in making it to a short list of, uh, you know, let's say 10 individuals when you have uh, hundreds of people applying for the position. It's very difficult to stand out. So this is definitely a way to try and get that kind of opportunity. So I would say uh, a combination of, uh, of both, but you would need to invite somebody from uh, our HR to really understand how they are running through the CVs and uh, what kind of elements could be helping candidates to stand out. Because obviously when we open a job, I don't get to review all uh, you know 500 applications. It's, uh, it's something that they're doing at their level. Yeah. Thank you for, for, for that. Well, I think well, it, it, it is a very sort of a trick, tricky question and I think also comes soon what level of position you're applying. Once you have more experience, then you kind of have defined more or less your path in the area that you're going to uh, work in. But as you said, when you entered the, the IOC as, um, as an intern, you had a different background, you had some communications background, and perhaps you mentioned if there was some position open there, you could have actually taken uh, something in, in, in that area as well. So it's uh, each story is, 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 is a different one, I, I think. Um, anyway, there's a few more questions um, coming. Uh, just uh, maybe you can give some advice here. Before we go there, uh, there's a Marco Kostic uh, from Serbia. He Serbia. He participated here. I think he was uh, in the conversation with uh, Frank Menders not so long ago. Uh, Yasmin from from Jordan. There's a LinkedIn user here from uh, Guyana, but watching from Paris. And Marco here asks a question specifically about. So he has a uh, background in international relations. So has something to do with what you studied as well and did the MA in sports manager. For which position then in sports that profile is suitable, you you would see? Is it public affairs or, I don't know, you, you might want to use the IOC as an example or general, you know, the international federations very well as well? Yeah, I mean, typically, uh, I, I share uh, probably the questioning that uh, Marco is having right now because I was there. I came out having an international relation master's and thought, okay, I'm not too sure what this can allow me to do. And then decided because the sport part was really intriguing to me to combine it with sports management. So I had both of the, uh, uh, the qualification that he has. And uh, for me, it was clear what I wanted to do. So I went after sport and Olympic Games uh, departments because that's where I had interest. And I think it's important, Marco, you ask yourself 
the question, what is really of interest to me? Because with the background you have, international relations, sports management, clearly you could be a, a candidate for positions in, uh, in my department, the Olympic Games department, in the sport department, quite straightforward. But you could also, uh, you know, be uh, interesting for our communication and public affairs department. Uh, and then we have other areas which are also of international relations nature, which are like uh, Olympic solidarity, for example, relation with national Olympic committees. There's a number of things which uh, could be of interest and where your profile could be relevant. Depends also what you did uh, in your undergrad uh, studies. If you studied law or other things, then you could imagine that this element is an important part of, um, of where you want to work. But I think I go back to what I said earlier, Joao, it's really about what is it that you want to do and that you really go after roles in that specific uh, area because there are hundreds of jobs in the IOC, not opening uh, regularly, but I would say in the nature of the job, we have everything. But what I would do versus what somebody from our Olympic Solidarity or somebody from our communications department do is very different. I sometimes have an impression that people want to work for the IOC first and foremost. Then comes, oh, well, you know, <laughs> whatever the department somehow. And I think it's important to stand out in the application process that there is really a connection between the job itself, which is posted, not because it's an Olympic job, but because it's a venue's job or it's a communication job, I think it's really important that people come and demonstrate that this is of interest and that the IOC, of course, is a good platform to learn and progress and bring skills, but it's not the first element in the application. Yeah, no, 100 percent. Yeah, this is something that uh, we touch on, you know, regularly is that um, a lot of the sort of the applications or people that want to work for sports in general, you know, presenters, the first reason is their passion for, for sports. And a lot of people say, I would love to work for the Olympics, for the Olympic Games, and I love the games. And But basically, that's the reason why you, as a person, want to work there. The recruiters actually want to know why they should hire you. I mean, what actually you bring to to, to the job and whoever is, is, is hiring you. Hiring you. Um, you, I think you already touched on this. I'm just uh, going to read this because I think it was a very nice message from Camilla Murray in Canada. Your career path is inspiring. What advice recommendations do you have to someone to be in your position, reach the level that you have someday? I think you, you, you covered um, a bit that, but if there's any addition that you would like to, to make. Yeah, I think, Camilla, thank you for the question. It's uh, You have to look at what do you have today as a profile and what would be the profile, uh, uh, let's say, looked for in the organization and roles you are, um, you are going for. If you want to be working in, uh, you know, uh, marketing in the IOC and you have such and such profile, do a gap analysis. Try to understand what is it you don't have right now. Is it a language issue? Uh, is it, uh, you know, specific sport training? How can you bridge this gap so that you become an interesting candidate for these positions? But once again, I really think that uh, the IOC is a great employer for sure, but that sometimes you should try and, you know, take a step uh, before, as you were saying earlier, Joao, you know, like FIFA for you, great, it's FIFA, but at the same time, the role and what you were doing, not great. So it's not because it's FIFA that you need to uh, consider anything uh, else is not of interest. So it's more about what are the, uh, the jobs that interest you? What part of sport interests you? Because sport is a very broad concept somehow. And uh, once you know that, then really try to break down the elements you are missing. There's a few people working for the IOC today that I've been talking to for maybe more than a decade. And they approached me at the time, you know, okay, I'd like to work. Uh, this is my profile. What should I do? And I broke it down with them in discussion. And they went to, uh, you know, the Olympic Academy in Athens, 
went to uh, spend a year abroad to uh, have a English uh, oral and written level that would uh, you know take a, another level did some sports specific studies and somehow came back a few years later said okay well I did it all uh, you know I'm going to start applying and uh, and uh, of course when you have that kind of uh, commitment and people doing everything right it says a lot also about the people themselves you know that they are able to build a plan do what what it takes to present themselves in the best possible way but I would say the success rate at the end of this process is not oh I'm working for the IOC it's really I'm working in sport in a position which I am really happy to be in 100% yeah thank you so much actually um, we're gonna go back to some more career advice in a bit there's a uh, questions uh, coming through so keep sending them we still have uh, some more time to go through them as well if you are Enjoying that, want to show your appreciation to Pierre and, and to us. Uh, it would be great if you hit that like button there. Yeah, we'll come back to career advice in a bit. I want to know a little bit more about your career and your story in particular. Now, you've been at the IOC for a long time, so over 15 years. And uh, so you've been to several Olympic Games and other sports events. Uh, normally, suppose in some VIP areas, maybe get got to meet many sports heroes that uh, some of us would just dream to, to meet. Do you have any sort of special story to to share? I mean, what's for, for you, I mean, what's your favorite uh, career mo uh, moment in that sense as a, as a sports fan? That's a tough one, Joao. Uh, I, I don't, and that's just who I am, I guess. Don't get too starstruck, I believe. So I have met a lot of people, but I always try to look at, uh, you know, the individuals for who they are. And what would really uh, impress me is some of these people who have had huge careers. I worked with the Athlete Commission for a number of years before I moved to the Games Department. And uh, what I really enjoyed is those athletes who were standing out, but uh, never really made you feel that they had achieved something great in their sport career or where, you know, people that will get recognized. And I've met a number of them. I don't want to go into names, but to me, this is really what stood out, that you could be with people who everyone in the street would, uh, you know, recognize, but that didn't really mind and didn't change their behavior because of that. They were very accessible and, uh, and, uh, and approachable. And I, I really enjoyed that, uh, that kind of, I would say, ability to connect with people who stayed completely themselves beside the fact that they were, I would say, public figures. Now to the earlier part, what are the standouts of my Olympic career? One that always comes to mind is the first edition of the Games I attended because I was an intern. I started December 2003, so basically six months before the Olympic Games in Athens. I obviously was not the first choice to go to the Olympic Games because despite what people believe in the IOC, there's a lot of people that don't get to go to the Games. It's a very long and uh, precise process to select who needs to be on site. We don't want to add a necessary number of people in the host city. So as an intern, I was probably rock bottom on the list of, uh, you know, pick to go to Athens. But through... Uh, uh, some circumstances of, uh, of projects I had to get involved with and that got much bigger during the games than necessary. I was called during the games to go to Athens. And I'd been in the IOC six months, so you start to get familiar with a little bit of the concepts, but until you see it for yourself and live uh, it from within, uh, you, you don't really understand. And I think that's where my interest for the games and my, my, my passion somehow for that environment was born. I, I, I really was maybe in that moment a little bit starstruck by what it represents. I was working inside the Olympic Village, which was amazing in many respects, not so much because you see people you know, but just because of the actual atmosphere, the sense of community, how people come together from all walks of life. <coughs> I, I, I really was always, I would say, influenced by that first um, 
that first moment. There has been others as well, but I would say if I had to name one, that is probably the one that uh, justifies why I'm still here today and continue to, uh, you know, find uh, that this role and that job and that organization connects with my values and uh, and what I need to be within to to feel good in in my work every day. Great. Um, and uh, in terms of challenges, Pierre, if you were uh, to mention one, maybe the biggest challenge, I don't know if it, this is going to be it, the, the, the current corona uh, virus crisis, or maybe in, a, in an earlier stage, is there one that you thought was very, uh, maybe the biggest challenge that you had professionally in your life? And, and maybe you can share what you learned from it. Um. Had you asked me a year ago, uh, Joao, I would have said hands down Rio, for sure, for uh, you know the the challenges it uh, it had to deliver these games in a very complicated time for Brazil. Uh, this was really, I think, for the IOC a massive undertaking. We had to take a much more engaged role than we ever did. I spent uh, five months in Rio uh, with the team there, shoulder to shoulder preparing for this game. So this was professionally uh, definitely the most enriching experience I've I'd had up until we decided to postpone the games in Tokyo, I would say, because I can't find words what it represents to take uh, something like the games and push them back by a year and having to deliver them in an environment where at this point in time, when it comes to the circumstances, We don't know anything for sure. We know we will deliver the games, but we don't know exactly how we're going to fine tune some elements. And all of those which are listening, I'm sure they are very much, uh, you know, uh, aware of the complexity of events and that Olympic Games uh, is one of the, you know, most uh, complex event to deliver because of the sheer number of people and uh, the fact that they happen in one city. But you take that complexity which we are working hard to simplify every day, but you take the inherent complexity of doing an event like the games and you start looking at all the variables that needs to be considered and you know, look at them, it becomes the biggest puzzle you can think of and a puzzle where some of the little, uh, I don't know what you call the, the puzzle pieces somehow, change shape day right. after, you know, one day after the other. So when you think, oh yeah, This one fits here. The day after, one well, doesn't fit anymore because the environment has changed and you need to be able to adapt to this. So I would say professionally, and I'm pretty sure most of my colleagues involved with us in this, uh, in this endeavor would say the same. This is a, a gigantic undertaking, something yeah. which professionally is extraordinarily interesting, also extraordinarily tiring because it means that on our side, The commitment that we normally put to deliver games, because it's not as straightforward as uh, as it uh, people could think to deliver games, is now amplified to a degree which uh, certainly the IOC has not known in the past. And I'll add the fact that we now have two games within the span of five months, with yeah. Tokyo followed very quickly by Beijing, also adds the, uh, a layer of complexity which we haven't had to deal with in the IOC ever. Yeah, no, yeah, I love the analogy of the the puzzle that changes shape. Uh, it, gi it gives a good sense of, of, of the challenge that you're having. Um, there's a few more questions coming in. There's one comment here that I need to, to show to you. Of course, we, we talked about him today. So John says, uh, Piero looking good. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and experience, 100%. I, the beginning, John. I, I said you didn't hire me. So, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I made a mistake where well, you just corrected me. John has nothing to do with that. But okay, uh, John, good to hear from you. Yes, uh, there uh, we'll bring a few more questions um, up. We're going to the the end, the last sort of 10 minutes of, of our of our chat. Pierre, um, a few weeks ago, there was a brilliant question coming from the audience. Um, asking uh, my interviewee at the time, I think was uh, Misha Sher, and then I asked uh, Frank Landers uh, the same thing. What was 
their biggest uh, setback or failure. We talk about the successes, you know, where things go right. But can you maybe share uh, an example of where things went wrong for you and perhaps what you learned from it? Well, I have to give it some thoughts. Obviously, there are many setbacks, you know, that uh, you, you, you face at some point. I, I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, you get much better after setbacks because in general, if things go smoothly, in the end, you don't question anything anymore. And when you start to see that you're doing something which is not delivering the result you want, um, it's, uh, it's very rich in lessons learned. So that's something that I would definitely encourage my team to consider, you know, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail trying to do some of the things, but at least uh, we need to, first of all, be able to reinvent ourselves if we fail, but also debrief what, um, what went wrong. Um, I can't think really of one particular moment where, um, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that there hasn't been many setbacks. Of course, there are many, but I'm trying to think about one that would stand out. And I can't think of something which would be very telling. But uh, I'm definitely not afraid of setbacks. I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say that because there probably are setbacks or challenges coming every day in, in numbers. You had a plan and it gets, uh, you know, completely <laughs> thrown out the window because uh, in an event like the games, in an environment like we have right now, as I said, nothing is certain. So setback is the name of the game. And again, I think uh, the key is really for people to embrace setbacks. You know, for me, that's really how I look at it. Uh, I know when I start on a journey to do a project that uh, it's not going to go like we thought it would. So uh, you may as well just take the hurdles and uh, again, uh, embrace them. But uh, I, maybe I'll, I'll, if I can think of a, a good example, I'll, I'll let you know, uh, but it doesn't spring to mind right now. Okay, okay. N next time I'll send, uh, I'll do that, I'll send in advance. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's a, that was Alessio Pietra that asked that a few weeks ago because he said that he likes the question. Actually, he has another one. Um, he would like to know if you ever thought of, you know, doing something else. If there is, a, if you were, if you're not working at the IOC, if you, you know, with your skills and your passions, if there's other type of job that you would like doing? Well, I think about doing something else all the time. That's my um, probably nature. You know, I like to think, project, imagine how it would be. And I think that's a very healthy uh, process. So, you know, okay, uh, what if I was doing this? Of What if I would move into that? What if I would, you know, go and create my own business? I, uh, I'm always thinking about these options. I weigh, that's uh, fundamentally how I function. I weigh, you know, the pros and cons and uh, and just take decisions from there. And I would say probably the demonstration that I'm not really considering going anywhere is that although I'm doing this process, I've never left the IOC so far. I would connect this with what I said at the very beginning. For me, the key element really is not to look at my watch during the day. You know, if I'm like, oh, okay, uh, when is it going to end? That uh, it doesn't feel like this is routine or lengthy or boring. I get bored very quickly. So um, this is definitely an element which can make or break my interest for um, a position, whatever that position is. I'm, I'm, I think made of a wood that makes it that if I don't like what I do every day, I'll definitely go explore something else. But uh, when people tell me, how is it possible? You've been, uh, let me calculate, yeah, 16 years in the same organization. Hmm. And I, the only answer I have is, I certainly never thought in a million year, I would be that kind of, uh, you know, one type of organization person, but uh, I never got bored. 
until this day, I never got bored. I always had new projects, new challenges, new team, new uh, new things that make it uh, very different every day. So I wouldn't say I will not get bored or I will not want to find in the end something which excites me more. I'm really uh, weighing those things in my head. But uh, so far, I guess, uh, since I'm still here, <laughs> I can't really say that uh, I have found something out there which uh, was clearly outweighing uh, the, 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 let's say, interests I can have in my uh, current job. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a few other questions here. I'm going to take one that probably will be uh, the last one. It has to do with technology. And Facundo Cerda from Argentina, from Argentina, says um, considering new technologies as artificial intelligence in this case going forward fast. What skills going to be required to the near future? Do, do you sense uh, already sort of a, a change in the trend of people that are joining uh, the organization needing to be tech savvy? But probably that's an obvious question actually. Uh, but how do you see the, the role of technology changing then the, the profile of people working for organizations like the IOC? I think it's really a good question. And uh, we, we can see that in general today, even in our own department, we certainly pay attention to, uh, let's say, technology skills of people, their ability to really embrace the latest developments, to, to know how we can best benefit from, uh, you know, what is today an, expo an exponentially growing domain. So if you have people in your team that can understand the opportunities here, we see that as really um, creating a lot of values. Now, uh, in addition to every individual person that we are probably looking to recruit, having this profile, we know it's not an option for people which are of the older generation. Uh, and I think slowly, uh, people like uh, you, me, we are, despite our keen interest into technology, which I know you have, I have as well, we start to be a little bit outdated on a number of developments, and that's just normal. But it's important that the people that come into jobs, they have a keen interest to embrace those developments uh, or to lead those developments. And in addition, clearly today in the IOC, like in any other companies, I think we are... Uh, you know, in the middle of a digital age that requires the way of doing things to be transitioned, to be transformed. We recently created in the IOC a digital engagement department, which is really basically, I guess, the, the image that uh, you need to have in an organization to have people whose job it is to take you from, uh, you know, uh, the organization that is to the organization that should be in a, in a digital environment. And uh, in that sense, people that have really those skills that can be um, used uh, for this digital transformation and this digital strategy, I think it's clear today they have a, probably a higher likelihood to be attractive to the IOC or other companies because it is skills that not everybody have and uh, that are probably very uh, sought after. Cool. Thank you, Pierre. Well, maybe just uh, uh, before we wrap up, I uh, don't know if you're having much time for that so lately, but uh, if you listen to podcasts or if there's a, so YouTube channels so in sport or in sports management or books, anything that uh, you would like to, to recommend, is there anything that you read recently or on that field that you'd like to, to recommend or you listen to? Um, I listen to podcasts, a lot of TED talk. So uh, I always find that very interesting because the sad thing about this job is it doesn't leave you a lot of time to do things you like beside work. So I try to look at things which don't take too much time and that I can consume whilst I'm going somewhere or um, that that's something I find very interesting. But I recently read a book which uh, been recommended i think 200,000 times by a number of people which was the biography of uh, andre agassi because i'm a keen oh, yeah. fan and uh lots of people have told me oh you should read this book you should read this book and i took the time to read it and i i thought it was fascinating the the, the book because it really somehow 
uh, demonstrate how you can excel at something that you hate somehow. And uh, the, the, this description that he has of tennis as a sport that created for him his name, his fortune, everything else, but that I think deep down he doesn't like. I thought this was really interesting. And uh, also the, the transparency, the candid report on, uh, on his career. Uh, if anybody is interested into that kind of paradox and tennis, I think it's an absolute must read. So for those uh, that haven't read it, please uh, take less time than me to get to the book and, and read it. Great, great book, great recommendation from a very talented tennis player as well. So just be before we go, I want to say some hi to uh, just a, a few more people that uh, were here with that... Um, Arjun Singh from, from, from India. Uh, hello, there's also Sukrit from India. Thank you for, for being there with us. Keshav also from India. So we have a, a big audience there. There is Mohammad Reza from Iran. He's been uh, with us um, a few, um, a, a few uh, episodes uh, as well. That's pretty much everybody else. Guys, I want to thank every, everybody for, for being part of this. One hour went flying. It was uh, great talking to you, uh, Pierre. This was a nice, nice excuse to, you know, to, <laughs> to, to yeah, to, to, to chat again. We haven't had the, the chance to meet uh, in, in, uh, in a bit since that last time at, uh, at, the, at the tennis club, it wasn't uh, when there was a break in the, corona club, uh, the coronavirus want to thank you very much for this. Just uh, stay there for another minute because I'm going to remind everybody that in five days, we're going to have the I Work in Sports Education Virtual Expo. It is a free event. So if you're interested in education, in sport, want to meet the, the best masters in sports in the world, talk to their uh, representatives um, and also to the alumni. So you'll have the chance not only to talk to people that will give you all the information that you need to take the course, but also from people that took those masters and you, and you learn from them how it, um, how it was, how the experience was. Um, yes, do that. The uh, link is in the description below. Thank you so much uh, for being there with us. Next week is the event, so we won't have the I Work in Sport live. So in two weeks' time, we'll be back with uh, another special guest. Pierre, once more, thank you so much. Anything else that uh, you want to say before we go? Uh, thank you, Joao. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope this was helpful to uh, the audience. And uh, yeah, good luck with your uh, expo and uh, good luck for the next uh, I Work in Sports seminars. Thank you, Pierre. No, it was, it was brilliant.